Okay, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, I can see people still joining, but welcome to the ninth webinar in our discussion series on tipping elements, irreversibility, and abrupt changes in the Earth system. My name is Tim Lenton. Um, I think I appeared in the first of these webinars, but my job today is to chair. Um, the overall goal of our discussion series is to advance knowledge on tipping points in complex systems, uh, support efforts to improve the consistency of the treatment of what we call tipping elements um, within the scientific community, develop a research agenda, design some uh, joint experiments and some modeling activity in something called a tipping element model into comparison project or TIPMIT for short. Uh, several scientific networks are behind this uh, webinar series. That's Firstly, the Earth Commission, uh, which is a global team of scientists with a mission to define a safe and just corridor for people and the planet. Uh, secondly, um, the, something called the Analysis, Integration and Modeling of the Earth System Project, or AIMS for short. Uh, it's a global research network composed of Earth System scientists and scholars that are seeking to develop interdisciplinary ways to understand the complexity of the natural world and its interactions with human activities. Um, both AIMS and the Earth Commission are hosted by Future Earth, which is a global network of scientists, researchers and innovators collaborating for a more sustainable planet. And then the third major partner in the webinar series is called the Safe Landing Climates Lighthouse Activity of the World Climate Research Programme, WCRP. That's exploring routes to safe landing spaces for humans and natural systems in this changing climate. So. The focus for today is going to be on paleoclimate insights into past societal collapse. Um, both of our speakers are going to present before we have a Q&A session together. Uh, however, during their talks, you feel, feel free to pose questions in what's called the Q&A feature, which you should see at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and try to indicate uh, to whom your question is directed, whether it's one speaker, the other, or both. And then everyone else, once you've got your question in there, can upvote their preferred questions. We'll get to these questions in a, the discussion session, as I said, after both the presentations. We've also got some, something called an interactive Miro board. Um, so I think a link for that will go in the chat. Basically, you can make comments or suggestions for future research there. Um, the Miro board will be kept open throughout the week. Uh, so if you have thoughts after today, you can record them there. Um, and following the event today, we'll post the recording on the Tipping Point series confetti webpage. So it'll be accessible there in the future. All right. So I'm going to get, move on to introducing the first speaker. Um, absolute pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Joseph Tainter. Uh, wrote the book on the collapse of complex societies that's been certainly shaped my thinking. Um, He's taught at the University of New Mexico and Arizona State University, and until 2005 directed the Cultural Heritage Research Project in the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, his, his study of why societies collapse led to research on sustainability more broadly with an emphasis on energy and innovation. He's also conducted research on uh, land use conflict and human responses to climate change. Uh, Joe's appeared in documentary films and television programs, in print media and radio programs, and he's appeared in the film The Eleventh Hour, produced by Leonardo DiCaprio, no less. Uh, so thank you for being here, Joe. I'm going to hand the floor to you, invite you to share your screen and uh, tell us a little bit of your thoughts on explaining uh, collapse past societies. Oh, oh, thank you, Tim, and, and greetings to all. Um, I guess for many of you, it's late afternoon. Uh, for those of us here in the American West, it's mid-morning, um, but regardless, um, I will get underway. Uh, let's see, here we go. All right, there we go. That's, that's what I wanted to get. Um, the fields in which I work, archaeology and history, um, have long been uncertain about how to evaluate collapses. Um, these disciplines, uh, I have argued, have predominantly had what I call 
a progressivist narrative. Uh, archaeologists and historians, of course, are socialized members of complex societies. We've been raised in the ideology of modern industrial societies, which emphasize progress. So we accentuate how our ancestors tamed fire, developed agriculture, invented the wheel and writing, established cities and artisanship, and created states, all the while, all the while improving human life. Much of this narrative resembles what anthropologists term ancestor myths. Ancestor myths validate a contemporary social order by presenting it as a natural and sometimes heroic pro progression uh, from a simpler past, a less desirable past to the way that we live today. Within this narrative, collapses in dark ages have presented troubling contradictions in the story of humanity's continual progress. If the arc of history leads to inexorable improvement of the human condition, how could that trajectory ever be interrupted? Equally troubling, if collapses happened in the past, could one happen again? It's difficult to pinpoint when collapse studies began. Uh, much depends on how you define the term, but it's common to look to Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire as the ancestor of modern collapse studies. Uh, other authors in Gibbon's era addressed what they termed decline and fall. Uh, the scholar Sam Volney ascribed collapse to greed and class conflict. Uh, the French philosopher Montesquieu advanced an argument based on morality, power derived from Roman virtue and declined when the Romans advanced beyond Italy. The great Arab historian Ibn Khaldun in the lower right here in the 14th century continued what had been a longstanding tradition of considering history to be cyclical. Uh, dynasties, he particularly focused on North African dynasties, dynasties he thought of a natural lifespan like individuals. The greatest cyclical theorist was the Greek historian Polybius. In the second century BC, he predicted the fall of the Roman Empire uh, some 600 years before it actually happened. Uh, this, I think we have to record as the greatest prediction in human history. Uh, societies to ancient historians like Polybius developed like the biological cycle through growth, maturity, senescence, and death. It was thus no challenge to predict that Rome would eventually fall. Now, although long in disrepute, cyclical theory has been resurrected recently by the population biologist Peter Turchin, who bases his approach on Ibn Khaldun. Uh, Buzz Hollings resilience theory, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is a nuanced update to cyclical theory. In resilience theory, the basic model derives from forest succession rather than from the growth and death of organisms. Another collapsed scholar, Norman Yaffe, has pointed to early Mesopotamian literature that may be the earliest surviving ancestral explanation of what today we call collapse, dating to 3,000 years ago. In considering the fall of Sargon of Akkad and the third dynasty of Ur, the decline of empires was ascribed by Mesopotamian writers to the impiousness of rulers and to marauding enemies sent by the gods as punishment. Cities flourish under good kings, but suffer under impious ones. Collapse theories often express ideals and criticisms of the social world. And this is a topic I'll come back to. These theories are influenced by, and sometimes attempt to influence contemporary social issues. During the tumultuous 18th century, for example, Gian Battista Vico and referring again to Volney, attributed collapse to factionalism and conflict, while Gibbon saw in the Roman collapse the failure of leadership. In the aftermath of World War I, Oswald Spengler foresaw the decline of the West, wrote a famous book with that title, while the, expat, while the Russian expatriate academic Rostovsev, 
perceived in the Roman collapse a foretaste of the Russian Revolution. The moral uncertainty of the 20th century influenced Toynbee's emphasis on internal discord in spiritual values. Many writers today, as we know, link collapse to environmental resources with failure brought on by anthropogenic degradation, climate change, or a combination of factors, including these. Where the explanation focuses on environmental damage, a collapse is like a Greek tragedy. The protagonist brings on self-destruction. Kings and emperors frequently legitimized their rule to, by claiming a role as divine intermediaries. They are thus responsible for weather and a good harvest, much as presidents and prime ministers today are considered responsible for a good economy. Poor weather and a failed harvest would indicate that the ruler had not fulfilled this responsibility. The history of China illustrates this. Widespread catastrophes, failures of crops and unrest were taken as signs that a dynasty had, last, had lost what is called the mandate of heaven, which legitimized rule. Loss of the mandate of heaven was greatly to be feared as it signaled that a dynasty's end was near. Similar beliefs still persist, although with different terminology. Even today, China's rulers are concerned to limit the spread of bad news, fearing how the populace would perceive failure. A variant of this approach is that kings and emperors may not be exclusively to blame for collapse. The fault rather belongs to entire social strata, particularly the elites. Uh, the writer Tenny Frank, for example, ascribed the Roman failure to lack of vision on the part of the landed gentry, their willingness during the Republic to betray the peasantry for large slave estates and to accept the monarchy for personal safety. There's a long history within anthropology in my own field and other social sciences a scholarly, scholarly interest in the environmental dimensions of social life. This interest has naturally found expression in the study of collapse. In general, the literature of this strand postulates that collapses result from shortages of resources brought on by normal environmental variation, abrupt climate shifts, or human damage. Discussions of our own sustainability frequently postulate that ancient societies collapsed because they, did, because they degraded their environments, justifying the concern that today's societies could collapse for the same reason. An environmental focus, though, requires adjustments in the assignment of blame. It's expectable that collapses in the days of rule by kings and emperors were attributed to the failings of leaders or the class from which they came. In the days of democracy and mass consumption, though, blame is not so easily narrowed. The people themselves must be responsible for collapse, so it is thought. This is so whether the collapse occurred in the past or is merely foretold for us. And so where collapses were once attributed to impious or selfish rulers, to selfish elites, or to indolent masses, in today's framework, the sin is gluttony. Ancient societies collapsed because they overshot the carrying capacities of their environments, degrading their support bases in the process. And since it happened to past societies, it could happen to us. According to contemporary literature, the next collapse will come because all of us have consumed too many goods, eaten too much, traveled too far, produced too many children, and used too much fossil fuels. Fossil fuel. The Greek tragedy unfolds even as numerous Cassandras warn us to mend our ways. There is another strand of thought that holds humans blameless. Collapses just happen. Uh, the historian, English historian J.B. Burry once argued that there was no systematic reason for the fall of Rome. It resulted from a series of contingent events the eruption of the Huns, Roman mismanagement, weak emperors, and employment of barbarians in the army, all occurring over a short time. In other literature, as we know, the fact of precipitating collapse is thought to have been a change in climate. 
cold, heat, or drought deprived a society of the resources it required, and collapse ensued. As what I call a deus ex machina explanation, and I'll, and I'll clarify that term in a minute, both scholars and the public find climate change perpetually attractive. Past societies were destroyed by, by abrupt climate change, although for them it was unforeseeable. We, however, must take care not to cause such a change ourselves. So collapse studies clearly have a long history involving a plethora of explanations. Uh, the literature on collapse has become vast, especially since 1988. Uh, it's possible to synthesize from this literature uh, common explanatory, is it possible to synthesize from this literature common explanatory themes or even a consensus? Fortunately, two studies pictured here have considered collapse cases in breadth and to some extent in depth. Uh, these are the, the studies by myself and a more recent book by uh, the British archaeologist Guy Middleton. Now, from this literature, I've identified 17 cases of collapse. Let's just go through them briefly. Old Keep, Kingdom Egypt, Akkad, the Third Dynasty of Ur, the Harappans uh, in West South Pakistan, Minoan Crete, Mycenaean Greece, the Hittites of Anatolia, the Western Roman Empire, Monte Alban in Mexico, Teotihuacan in Mexico, the classic Maya, Cahokia in the American Midwest, the Moche, um, Tiwanaku, in Peru, Wari in Peru, and Angor in Southeast Asia. Now I have three of these listed, oh, oh, and Easter Island, of course. I have three of these listed here as not actually collapses, but I've included them because uh, Guy Middleton includes them in his work. So they're the data included in the, included in the database that I worked from. So this can be, uh, let's see. The explanations can be grouped into eight themes. Um, actually, I should mention that there are 64 different explanations of collapse that have been advanced in these 17 cases. Um, and, then, and I grouped them into eight themes. So the first theme is climate change. And I won't go over all the cases to which it's been applied, but you can see for yourself that it's been applied to quite a few cases as an explanation of collapse. Uh, the second is invaders are external conflict. Um, the most famous cases supposedly being uh, the invasion of the My Mycenaean Greece by Dorian Greeks um, or the invasions of the Roman Empire by, by German tribes. Revolt and rebellion. Uh, postulated to have affected a number of societies uh, from both the old and new worlds. An intra-societal conflict, again, affecting a number of societies, thought to have affected a number of societies. Uh, environmental deterioration, other than climate change, uh, affecting several societies. Catastrophes, um, such as epidemics, plagues, earthquakes, and volcanoes, thought to have affected two societies, the Minoans in, the, in Crete and the Mycenaeans in mainland Greece, change in trade patterns, and finally, what I call mystical explanations that postulate such things as uh, religious or ideological change, loss of morality, various kinds of spiritual changes, and so forth. Now, among these explanatory themes, I want to bring attention to what I call deus ex machina explanations. Uh, the explanations here are that things just happen to societies. Uh, the term is Latin, but it derives from the Greek theater. When a plot became too complicated, the playwright would have a god descend on a mechanical contraption, that's the god from the machine, and set everything right. In the collapse literature, deus ex machina explanations occur in such factors as epidemics, hurricanes, plant parasites, volcanoes, floods, asteroids and comets, and climate change. We should always be skeptical, I would argue, of simple solutions to complex problems. 
it's a weakness of the human mind that we are commonly seduced by simple explanations when a problem is otherwise complex and difficult to resolve. So among all of these 64 explanations grouped into eight themes, there are two that seem to be consistently the most favorite, um, each involving 11 cases, barbarian invasions and climate change. Now, among the most favored explanations of this genre, that's 25 of 48 explanations or 58% are deus ex machina explanations, climate change, invaders, and catastrophes. Uh, in these explanations, collapse results suddenly and surprisingly from outside a society. Collapse, in other words, comes as a bolt from the blue. In other words, a plurality of scholars believe that collapse is just bad luck. Humans are not to blame. Now, while collapse explanations always reflect contemporary concerns, there's a theme to the study of collapse that's timeless. Uh, Misha Landau, in a very interesting study published way back in 1984, observed that descriptions of human biological evolution have, have a narrative structure like myths or folk tales. In such stories, the hero starts from humble beginnings, just as humans began as merely another unassuming primate. The hero undergoes various trials, acquiring new capabilities in the process, just as humans acquired an opposable thumb, upright posture, and a large brain. The hero finally triumphs, as did humans, although this triumph is often not the end of the story. In this narrative structure, we can also see our ancestor myths about the evolution of complex societies. Human society began as small, humbled, and threatened, but through heroic efforts, we discovered fire and agriculture and invented the wheel, metallurgy, cities, and civil society. The hero, humanity, had achieved its quest. In many myths, though, the hero is destroyed through pride or hubris. Just so, civilizations have collapsed, often through their own faults, and many people worry that it could happen again. So collapse theories are influenced by a number of things that change through time, by our need for an ancestor myth, which the phenomenon of collapse seems to contradict. They are even influenced by the structure of folk tales. Uh, they wax and wane in popularity according to the issues of the day. Ancient societies blamed rulers for failures of crops and for failing to secure the favor of the gods. In the 18th century, Volney, Gibbon, and their contemporaries saw collapse as resulting from the sort of factionalism occurring in their time and which the drafters of the American Constitution tried to counter. Collapse explanations were influenced by the world wars. During the Cold War, we had theories attributing collapse to elite mismanagement, class conflict, and peasant revolts. The environmental movement brought attention to environmental degradation in ancient societies. And as global warming became an issue, scholars of the past began to discover that, sure enough, ancient societies collapsed due to climate change. If elite consumption was ca once caused collapses, today the reason must be mass consumerism. But the trend cannot stop there. Given developments in the public arena, invariably someone must propose that societies are made vulnerable to collapse by inequality and the 1%. In fact, some authors already have. Such a model has been proposed by scholars at that bastion of historical inquiry, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and was based on sociological research somehow published in obscure physics journals. So as some final thoughts, it was predictable that scholars and popular writers today would explain collapse as resulting from climate change. We will always project onto the past the issues of our day. Scholars in the future will look back at our attempts to explain collapse by climate change and understand that the explanation was too simple. Much more is involved. 
My appeal to participants in this forum is to understand that collapse always involves the intersection of what's happening outside of society and what's happening within it. And in particular, we need to understand a society's adaptive capacity, what in other places are called reserve problem-solving capacity relative to the factors that stress it and threaten it. So with that, um, I thank you. Thank you, Joe, for that fantastic um, overview of the topic of collapse. Um, and if anyone has questions for Joe, please pose them, if you can, in the Q&A box. Apparently, you can also have a go at sticking them in the Miro board if you've managed to find it your way in there. And we'll come back to questions in the discussion session following our next speaker. So let me turn to our next speaker now before we come back uh, at the end to the Q&A. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Anne Kinsey in our research and looks at how humans shape and influence their natural environments and what this means for both human health and the Earth's ecosystems. Uh, her scientific research focuses broadly on ecosystem services, conservation development interactions and the resilience of natural resource systems. She's currently involved in a couple of major research projects, including one on the resilience of prehistoric landscapes in the American Southwest and one on modeling anthropogenic effects in the spread of diseases. Um, more recently, her research interests have been involved understanding how and when universities can effectively address societal challenges while still maintaining integrity, still maintaining integrity and scholarship, I should say, and how they must be organized to try and do that. So Anne was the first ever Roger Ravel Fellow in Global Stewardship, and in that role, she served in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Clinton administration. Anne, I'm going to hand the floor to you. Uh, looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm going to get my screen shared there. Good. Um, I can say that this talk will actually completely agree with Joe's conclusions. Um, so we could just stop there, but I'll give you a little bit more insight. Um, I'm going to shrink a lot in geography similar span of time and look at communities under climate stress in the pre-Hispanic American Southwest. I want to, okay, why can I not? Okay, I wanna say from the very beginning, I am not an archeologist. I'm an ecologist, as Tim has said, uh, someone who's interested in resilience and synthesis. And so the real experts on the case studies I'm gonna be talking about here are listed here. Um, Joe will be able to answer questions about details of any of these cultures better than I can, but this was a group effort that I'm going to be conveying here. And I'm going to look at, well, this group actually looked at six different communities in the Four Corners region of the United States and in Northern Mexico. Uh, number one was Mesa Verde, which some of you may be familiar with. It's an absolutely stunning place that you should go visit. This is a picture of Cliff Palace. Two is the Hohokam. We don't know what they called themselves, but that roughly means the ones who came before or the ancestors. Uh, a large irrigation society in what is now my home of Phoenix. And in fact, Phoenix is called Phoenix because we arose from the ashes of that civilization. The very first canals dug in Phoenix were dug from the remnants of Hohokam canals. Uh, the third is Zuni, which persi persists today and, and may be known to some of you today to the extent that you know the Four Corners region by um, these fetishes that they carve, really quite lovely. Uh, the fourth is the Salinas area um, along the Rio Grande. Fifth is Membrace, known uh, at the border of Arizona and New Mexico, known for this black on white pottery. And then the sixth is the La Quimada area in Northern Mexico. Most of these societies were far less complex, a uh, slight exception with La Quimada than anything Joe has talked about, right? These were largely subsistence agriculture societies um, in a very arid environment. So what's the problem? Climate changes in the American Southwest from about 900 AD to 1400 AD drove social change and eventually what we would call collapse for many cultural groups. So, Joe clearly has a definition for that because he said some of these groups did not collapse. Um, we tended to prefer transformation when we were talking about it 
A colleague once went to a second grade class and asked them what they thought it meant when cultures collapsed. And they thought about it for a moment and then just said, everyone must have just fallen over. Um, these, these collapses or these transformations take on lots of different forms. And these changes were not the same severity for all the groups involved. So were they just experiencing climatic challenges of differing magnitude, or was there something about the social organization that helped explain the differences? Again, in conforming to what Joe said, this group definitely resisted popular simplified pictures of cultural collapse driven by single environmental challenges. There's a version of collapse that says people were just stupid. Uh, and I think it's far more complicated than that. So in each one of our cases, there was a definite complex interplay of environmental factors that led to social responses that quite often led to new vulnerabilities in the long term. And so it's not enough to just look at one climate event. You actually have to look at the arc of climate events and social responses and connections on the landscape and what's happening in neighboring groups over time to understand what happened. So I'm actually gonna focus on climate since paleoclimate showed up um, in the title of this seminar. And I want to credit some of what the climate reconstructions I'm going to show you to this synthesizing knowledge of past environments. It's open now, we launched it fully to the public just a few weeks ago. Um, so, and this is the group of collaborators that worked on it. And in it, you can go to any of the parts of the Four Corners region of the United States and put down a point or a, a square or any other shape you choose and get various climate reconstructions, many of them driven by tree ring reconstructions. And this is just an example of some of the things you can get and lots of statistics on those reconstructions as well. I'm gonna collapse down to three of the case studies for this talk, 20 minutes long. I'm gonna look at the Hohokam, the irrigation, Zuni number three and Membrace number five. So this is actually a view not too far from my own house. This is the environment in which the Hohokam lived. Uh, it's a desert environment, the Sonoran Desert, very dry. They had a fully developed canal system by about 900 uh, AD, um, no metal tools. They dug these canals, some of which were large enough to drive a truck through um, with sticks and wood uh, and stones. It stretched from present day Tucson, so Southern Arizona to present day Flagstaff up on the rim in Northern Arizona, trades extending as far as Central Mexico. The public art architecture was initially ball courts. I put this here only because scholars look at public architecture as, a, as one of the measures of hierarchy and ball courts were largely accessible. They were possibly associated with markets, but it was a game in which people ran around in sort of a pit with sh shallow walls around it and everyone could watch. So that was the public architecture. Starting at about 1150 AD, the Hohokam shrink to the Phoenix Basin. The public architecture becomes platform mounds to which access is controlled. So it's thought that an elite lived on the top of those platform mounds and regular people could not access them. And there's evidence of problems with canal maintenance. In 1450 AD, more than 40,000 people simply disappear. There are some that died in place, but many just disappeared and we don't know where they went. They either were assimilated into nearby groups, but lost all signs of, of their culture or just as likely went into Northern Mexico to places that haven't been excavated yet. We just don't know. There was possible violence, serious health problems, and there was just an abandonment of these two large river systems, the Salt and the Gila River, for centuries afterwards. So what happened? Here's the climate reconstruction for a water year, October to September precipitation from about 500 AD to 1500 AD. And right in this area here, where we're coming out of a drought, we see this shrinking into the Phoenix Basin. And in this drought here, we see disappearance. Now, just one of the things I wanna point out is there were other droughts that seemed to engender less of a response. We didn't have a fully developed canal system here yet, but we had aggregation in response to this drought and then disappearance. So let's look at the Zuni. Zuni is also in a very arid environment here in New Mexico. 
Uh, for a time, they did sort of runoff farming. So they would, there were these shallow canyons um, and they put fields at different distance from the canyon walls in order to capture different kind, amounts of runoff under uncertainty about rainfall, small scale um, runoff, and then switching to irrigation later. Uh, they've been in their present location, slightly smaller than it was historically for 3,000 to 4,000 years. Um, by the late 1300s, all but central Zuni was depopulated. In the late 1200s, there was dispersed, there was dispersed hamlets concentrating to larger pueblos. Public architecture was a kiva, so some aspects of both being open, because if you're in the kiva, you're in a circle, but if you're outside of the kiva, you can't see what's happening. But what we saw with the Zuni was just a continuation of their cultural identity through the climate stresses and other stresses that the Southwest was experiencing. These lighter yellow orange bars on the top are the Hohokam, remember aggregation, aggregation and disappearance. The Zuni weather this period of drought here in the late middle 1100s, just fine. They don't start to aggregate until this more profound drought in their region, um, uh, but they persist through this drought. So when we see the Hohokam disappear in response to that drought, we see the Zuni persisting. Okay, so based on an N of two, we can in a totally unscientific way extrapolate and say, uh, people seem to aggregate in the US Southwest in response to droughts, um, but not all droughts. Some droughts seem to induce less social change, uh, less demographic change than others. And uh, one aggregation led to persistence in the case of the Zuni and the other to decline. So what if we added a third case? This is the landscape of the Membres. They were also an irrigation society, both uh, floodplain irrigation, river irrigation, and then sort of, uh, but also just grain fed agriculture with check dams. Uh, again, very dry environment. Small scale farming largely in, uh, Study population growth until about 550 AD, intensification of agriculture in what's called the classic period where there were aggregated villages, so sort of communal agricultural activities. At the, around 1130, there's a dry period and there was at this point dispersal. But the other thing we saw was the end of this black on white pottery and archeologists only have a few clues to go on um, as to identity, a cultural identity, but pottery is one of them. And so something was happening to cultural identity here at the end of the classic period. And by 1450, uh, at the same, around the same time as a Hohokam, there's just regional depopulation. So again, very similar picture, climatologically, not surprisingly, we were seeing climate change all over the Four Corners region. And here now in response to drought, we see a dispersal, and then a depopulation. Okay, so to drastically oversimplify. In response to a dry period, the Zuni aggregate, otherwise little observable cultural change. The Hohokam aggregate and become more hierarchical based on the public architecture and then ultimately disappear. And the membranes disperse and lose some cultural identity and then ultimately disappear. So can we explain those differences? in the way people were responding to periods of drought. So this group did a lot of work on resilience, social structures, rigidity, but one of the things focused on subsistence. And there are three basic ways that people deal with shortfalls. One is to rely on stored foods. So if you can uh, produce excess crop and store it, uh, can stay in storage for about three years it can see you through short droughts. Another is to exchange with social networks, right? Have a nearby but spatially removed group that you can rely on for food. So you can move to them and eat their food or they can trade for something else and give you food. And the third is to supplement with wild gathered resources. All of these ex respond to climate in a really different way or respond to different structures of the climate. Right, so food storage is influenced by temporal autocorrelations. If I have a run of wet years or a run of dry years, that influences food storage. So that's in one particular spot. 
Exchange actually relies on two places being anti-correlated with each other. My best exchange partner is someone who is nearby, but is having a good year when I'm having a bad year and vice versa. So that looks at spatial autocorrelation or anti-correlations in climate over landscapes. And the avail availability of wild resources integrates across space, time, precip and temperature to create niches for particular species that are edible. So it's not enough to just look at the precip reconstruction, right? You need, you need to look at spatial and temporal correlations and anti-correlations, both in place and across the landscape to understand how climate change stressed the subsistence strategies of different groups. Um, now, one of our premises is that these risk mitigation strategies would have emerged over generations. And so populations would have adjusted. So we aren't, well, let me just go to the next side. We aren't analyzing whether climates are good or bad. People were surviving on this landscape. Rather, we're assuming that cultures adapted to those climates and it's changes relative to say two or three generations worth of experiences that would have stressed their strategies, all right? So if the climate structure continued on as people had been experiencing, they would have managed. So we looked at all three of these on these landscapes for these cultures. For storage, we simply looked at the previous 60 years, which is about two to three generations, and counted as a wet year, anything that was half a standard deviation above that mean, and as a dry year, anything that was a half standard deviation below. We could have picked a different cutoff, but let's just go with that. And it results in maps like this, right? So um, the, the percent of time you might have had a storage shortfall, like there was a dry period that was so long that storage would have run out. So blue is good, red is bad. And we can map the US Southwest for any time period um, that, the pay, that the tree ring records will go to, uh, to look at what storage was looking like on these landscapes. I'm not gonna show you all three cultural groups each time, I'm gonna show you one. But here's Zuni. <clears throat> you can see they're having pretty low storage stress from 900 to about 1350. Uh, and then here in a period of persistence, but, but shrinking and centralization, they are clearly, there's spaces on this landscape that would be experiencing storage stress. All right, the second thing we looked at was wild plant resources. I don't wanna go into the gory details of the methods, but we identified hundred species as being used as wild gathered resources in the pre-Hispanic Southwest groups. And we basically constructed climate niches for them. <coughs> Excuse me. So looked at mean, we used other climate indicators. These were the two that turned out to be the most important. So present day presence absence data, mean annual temperature, mean annual precipitation, and constructed probability surfaces for all 100 species to get a species richness map. So these maps would look like this. Places where there's really no, it's, it's not that there's no species, but there's no species that people used in subsistence uh, at red up to blue where there's a high number of species. Whoops, sorry. So here's the Hoacom. Now, large irrigation society, probably a little less dependent on wild gathered resources, though certainly early in their existence, they would have hunted quite a bit. So in the 1300s, you can see on the Northern boundary that of this picture that there are there is access to wild gathered resources. In the 1350s, uh, things are looking pretty bleak. They're actually improving in 1450, which is when the Hoacom effectively disappear. So we have a severe transformation that wild resource stress is improving in this case. Finally, we wanted, we looked at what we call these anti-correlation maps. Uh, they're always res with respect to a focal cell. <clears throat> so I pick a focal scale, cell on the landscape and I run through every other cell. It's much like the storage. I'm looking for dry and wet years. And if I'm having a dry year, I run through to see which cells are having a wet year. If I'm having a wet year, I run through to see which cells are having a dry year. And I create an index of how often I can be of use to that other cell, community, 
settlement, and how often they can be of use to me. And that's where we would expect at least subsistence-based trade networks to emerge. So we get these maps are a little complicated. Blue means that other sites can help the focal cell. Red means the focal cell can help other sites. Gray and black means they can help each other equally. We almost never see that. We almost always see imbalance. Either I can help another site or that other site can help me. And so of course we create other forms of exchange. Maybe I'm very good at pottery and they give me food in exchange for pottery. Um, so remember it's always relative to a particular focal cell. So for any time slice, we could have hundreds of these maps for a particular cultural group. And I just wanted to show you one of the um, two different focal cells. So the focal cell in this case is the star. So I have this one mapped and this one mapped. And you can see that in this case, um, th they can be helped. Uh, I'm sorry, they can help th this Robinson, uh, sorry, Robinson can help this community. But you'd see the exact opposite if I created the anti-correlation map for this community. You can see that they can be helped by Robinson. So they take food from Robinson. Anyway, we can create these again. I've circled the focal communities here. This is now for Membrace. And you can see that in addition to drying, because I'm showing you this over a period of drying, we're not just getting drying, we're getting changes in the spatial correlations or anti-correlations on the landscape. So here, Cameron Creek Village um, used to be able to get help from up here in the north and it no longer can in this period where we see aggregation. You know, similarly here where it was helping others and there might've been trade relationships based on the capacity for this Los Animas village to help others, we're getting a sudden shift that would stress those trade relationships certainly because the previous expectation of what goods each community could deliver are being disrupted. Okay, I'm gonna to turn to some conclusions. As Joe said, there's a lot that can be happening and other, this is the mystical um, explanation. There were other interesting and some would say bizarre things happening on this landscape uh, during these periods of tra transformation. One is Chaco Canyon, um, about 800 to 1100 AD. This is Pueblo Benito, originally thought to be a very large uh, doesn't do it justice here. This thing's gigantic. A very large room block in which many people lived, now believed to be very few people living in it, and um, sort of a center to which people would just bring goods. And there are almost like Roman roads, these straight roads leading across the desert to Pueblo Benito. The Chaco phenomenon was quite widespread, so they had very intricate walls that they created. And these walls were duplicated outside of what would have been known as the Chaco cultural region. So Chaco was exerting a region-wide influence on people and influencing behavior and influencing belief systems. And in the late 14th century about, we get the rise of the Kachina cult. Um, these are god-like, god and goddess-like creatures um, that can either take the form of these dolls that are usually representations of the gods and goddesses or in human form in outfits, but belief to be the God personified take, take place in rituals. And this was a fairly widespread cult. Again, it, it extended beyond a single cultural group. Okay, these are gonna reinforce Joe's take home messages. Climate always intersects in complicated ways, both with the current social structures and the socio-demographic history of people. Some of the choices that they made in the past to deal with climate problems or other challenges, right? People are always organizing to deal with challenges. They can disperse, they can aggregate, they can become more equitable, they can become less equitable, they can become hierarchical. And so each drought is different because each society that drought confronts is different. Simple deconstructions of climate, just simply saying, oh, it got dry or there was a drought will miss the ways that the spatial and temporal autocorrelations or anti-correlations 
stress subsistence strategies. Our food insecurity could also come from climate, climate changes elsewhere with our exchange partners or in places that create refugee crises. So if part of my subsistence strategy is trade, the climate in my location could not change at all, but having a trade partner's climate change could still stress my subsistence strategies. Okay, these are still course messages. How much change is necessary before subsistence strategies are strained? And how do existing social and trade networks map onto these risk landscapes? Anyway, from our groups, it's clear that both the magnitude of environmental change and societal structures that influence innovation and decision making are implicated in the outcomes. It's also true that for most of these groups, the choices they made in response to an earlier drought increased their vulnerability in the long run. They simply disappeared, except for the Zuni. Uh, thank you, and I welcome any questions. Great, thank you, Anne, for that so excellent, excellent talk, getting into those case studies. And yeah, as you said from the start, the, both of you complemented each other brilliantly, I think. <laughs> At least I got the kind of take home message that it's never just about outside factors for a society. And it's probably not just about inside factors. It's some sort of interplay between how can I call it, how a complex society is evolving over time and then uh, external events. So uh, the audience, I welcome questions in the Q&A if you can manage to put them in there, but I noticed some have come up on the Miro board and one is lurking in uh, the chat function. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna pitch a question to both of you that comes from Sean um, and it brings us into the present. He says, economic degrowth has become a buzz term in many environmentalist circles, what are your thoughts on this or other eco-socialist theories as solutions to averting climate collapse in the present? <laughs> Maybe I go to back to Joe first. Uh, remembering Joe, your arguments about the Western Roman Empire, I'm, I'm sat here wondering if they if they had chosen not to continue expanding, whether they could have saved themselves. But what's your thoughts on the? Uh, Current in those current enthusiasts for degrowth. Well, you're on mute. You're on mute. I think. Okay, I think you can hear me now. All right. In, in my sustainability class, there's a question I pose to the students, and that is, are we heading for a steady state economy? In other words, an economy without growth, not, not addressing degrowth at this point. Um, and, and the question just baffles them. They can't imagine an economy without growth. Um, and, 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 but there are people who, who, who study this, who advocated some, some very good economic scholars who studied this. Um, and, and then there are more people who simply advocated. And, and I point out that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, among other things, it requires that birth rates have to equal death rates. So what does that mean? It means you have to have a permit to have a child. You know, how many people are going to put up with that? Um, and and, and, the, and the, there are other problems. It means that for someone to go up the economic ladder, someone else has to fall down by the same amount. Um, so a steady state economy simply doesn't work. And, and, I, and I think the same problems would apply, would apply to degrowth. Uh, I, I, I can't think of a voluntary case of degrowth in human history. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm going to come to Anne on the same question. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, I, I would largely agree with that. I think if you look at even what um, economic stagnation does to social, social dislocation and ills, it's hard for us to tolerate. Our, our current structure doesn't tolerate that well. I, you know, being an ecologist with, with some experience in evolutionary biology, I'm never thrilled with policies that seem to ignore the fact that we're human. Mm -hmm. um, and for whatever reason, we aspire to improving our condition. So if we were to have economic degrowth, it would not be without a lot of pain and dislocation. Having said that, I do think you can, uh, there are ways to have economic growth that's less damaging. So if we could get everyone to think that, you know, a $100,000 Rolex watch is what they want to signal status rather than a Humvee, then, then we're in better shape, right? So we could talk about the kinds of cultural change and status signaling that was less environmentally 
degrading um, and still maintain some form of economic growth. Remember, economic growth can come from like going to get massages. This is not very hard on the environment. Uh, and so I, I think there's some hope for dematerialization of economic growth, but I agree with Joe that transitioning to no or even degrowth is, is probably not in the cards, not, not achievable, but if it was achievable, it would cause a lot of human suffering. So when I press the uh, proponents of degrowth in debate or discussion, they say to me, oh, oh no, we're not saying degrowth for sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to let you know, solar, the solar power revolution come to sub-Saharan Africa and allow growth there. We actually just want uh, the richer over-consumers to consume, to degrow. So it sounds, seems to me that, that they've chosen the wrong title for their, for their manifesto in that case. They're talking about redistribution and, and tackling fundamental inequity in society. But Tim, um, even middle, so even coming back to that, do you think do you think there's a do you think that that's got uh, any lessons from history? Uh, maybe Anne first. Whether well, well, I don't know. I don't know about history. I'll let Joe speak to history. Even yeah. middle class families that in the United States, which globally would be considered quite rich, suffer when there's economic stagnation. Yeah, we see that in the UK as well. Yeah. I'll let Joe speak to the historic examples. I'm sorry, ask the question again, Tim. Um, if in fact the degrowth agenda is partly an agenda for, well, it's saying that the over-consumers should degrow, but the, those who are still in least developed countries still have the opportunity to grow. So essentially it's, it's, um, it's, a, redistrib it's a, a redistribution agenda rather than really a degrowth agenda. Does that give, uh, a different answer what would be your views on a, a I know it's a, it may be unworkable but if it were possible to do a, 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 a reduced global inequities agenda um, would that help stave off collapse or are there any lessons from history of <laughs> societies that did anything about growing in inequ inequity and tried to reverse the trend and that benefited them well I, I think most or perhaps all of, of the wealthier countries have economic assistance programs um, you know, to, to help the global south. Um, but my experience, at least with the US Congress, is that for the most part, they try to keep those budgets hidden from the population. Um, you, you know, when it comes out how much money is going to, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, inevitably there are people who get upset over that. So it's, I mean, it, it, it comes down to politics. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn to the Miro board because there's a couple of uh, questions there. Um, there's one from David Tabara, and it's to, to, to Joe first, at least. What about the role of the evolution of complexity in the collapse of societies? So your classic 1988 argument, I don't know if you'd like to expand. I, I kind of wanted to ask you whether you've, whether you've um, added or changed your argument around which around, around uh, the, how, how there are dwindling returns on increasing complexity and that ultimately makes societies more fragile, shall we say? Well, Where of course, you... I wrote a book on precisely that topic. Um, it, it, what, I, I study complexity and I, I, I should take this chance to clarify what I mean by collapse. Mm. Um, by collapse, I mean a rapid simplification, a rapid loss of complexity. And it's important to clarify that because, of course, collapse has a lot of colloquial meanings, and even scholars mean different things by it. You know, you know, Jared Diamond thought it meant population collapse or, or emigration, in the case of Greenland. Um, but, but I mean specifically a social, political, and economic simplification occurring over a rapid period, a short period of time. Uh, the classic case being the transition from the Roman Empire to the Dark Ages, what's called the Dark Ages in Europe. Uh, focusing on complexity, I have argued that, uh, well, well, you go to the question, why did human societies ever become more complex? Yeah, uh, I think there are a couple of reasons for it. I, I would expand what I wrote in the 88 book. Um, in the 88 book, I argued that complexity grows to solve problems. And, and I think most of the time that is the case. Um, but there are also, but I think also you can add to that that, that, that there is opportunity stimulated growth uh, when a society simply has an excess of resources. And we tend to think that that's normal because that's the period we're in now. 
But in fact, those periods have been rare in human history. Um, you can think of perhaps a few centuries after a society develops agriculture, but then population catches up. Uh, certainly the Industrial Revolution, uh, the fossil fuel revolution, those have given us en enormous amounts of wealth, but, but what we're finding is that there are limits to how much of it we can use. Um, so so it's, there, is, there is opportunity driven uh, complexification, but I think it's rare. It, it, it occurs, it has occurred only a few times in human history. Most of the time, complexity grows to solve problems. Uh, the, the classic example being government uh, increasing bureaucracy to, to address issues that people want addressed. Uh, the, the case study I really love to study is, is the evolution of military technology, military strategies, which is perhaps the ultimate case of how complexity increased simply to keep pace of, of what your adversaries are doing. Um, and, and complexity is also an economic function. Complexity has costs, and this is ultimately the basis of the argument I made about uh, the role of complexity and the cost of complexity in making societies vulnerable to collapse. So again, today, uh, we're not aware of this because we pay for complexity with fossil fuels. So we think it's free. But you have to remember that in, in ancient societies, increasing the complexity of a society meant that people worked harder. They paid higher taxes and 90% of the people were farmers and they had to work harder and give up more of their crops. So yes, um, if, if you want a more detailed account, um, there is that book I wrote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you, you told us about three different societies and you had more than three in your in your data set, as it were. But do, do they tell us some lessons about does does complexity evolve in different ways in different cases? Does some does some societies yeah. go down the path of this kind of um escalating complexity and others don't? Or uh so our you know, except for Lock Yamada these were not very complex societies relative yeah, to the to the sure. groups that Joe was talking about. But of course it develops in different ways. And I, I have a slightly different interpretation than Joe. I think complexity, of course, can emerge to solve problems. I also think it emerges because there is a group of people with some incremental advantage, whatever that is, that sees an opportunity for themselves to bring society into this more complex arrangement, right? So I think a lot of collapse in societies, and this is actually gonna speak a little bit to one of the questions in the Q and A. Hmm. I, I think at least part of the reason for collapse in societies is that the elite sees an opportunity uh, that they may be taking a big risk. Of course, you know they don't want to see a society collapse, but you don't know that it's gonna collapse. So they, they see some advantage to themselves to moving society down a particular path, at least a short-term gain, uh, and it, brings us to the edge of our resilience. You know, I think we saw this in the mortgage crisis of 2008, the big short. There, everyone who was participating in it knew that this was a terrible idea, that that bubble was gonna burst, but there was a short-term gain to be had for the elite that could access that. Uh, so, you know, especially in the case of the Hohokam, which is where we, is the only place we really see much of a hierarchy in these groups, I don't, or La Quimada, I just think there's an element of this. If you go back to Jared Diamond's book, he would again, I, I, there's some interesting case studies in that book, but he would largely argue that people were just dumb. And, and I think in, in, uh, instead people were actually being strategic about their own self-interests and not the community's interests. And that led us down particular pathways. Other things were happening as well, right? There was climate change, there were other groups, there was structural changes on the landscape. Lots of things were happening, but that's a piece of it. Yeah, yeah, very great. Uh, just before I move on to the next question, Joe, I can't resist this because so you when you describe uh, complexity arising to solve problems, I absolutely agree. But I also get the strong sense, even reading you, that complexity itself creates more problems. So <laughs> am I, it's like you've got a positive feedback loop or in evolutionary thinkers language, you created this red queen situation where you're having to run ever faster to try and stay in the same place. Is it? Is that, am I reading you right? Is that how you see it as well, sort of? Oh, oh, oh absolutely. Um, I, I wrote a paper a number of years ago in, in which I tried to address the question, what can be done about increasing complexity? Uh, and, and one solution is don't solve the problem. And, <laughs> and 
We actually do this all the time. If you look at, at government appropriating bodies, they decide all the time not to solve problems. Ah, that's fascinating. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to a question in the Q&A from Naki, who uh, says, great talks. One of the take home messages was that responses to earlier crises increase vulnerability in the long run. Arguably, we know uh, more even about complex systems today. But do you think that we might be facing the same risk looking at the long term future? So maybe I come to Anne first. Do we are we busy sort of solving problems in the short term in ways that make us even more vulnerable in the longer run? I mean, I think history tells us, yes, we, mm. we don't know necessarily what those vulnerabilities are going to be, but they are there. OK, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, they, they, that's obviously the case. You don't are there any chinks of light like um, like, what, what's the, problem, the problem we just solved was this pandemic, right? Well, I'm not sure we solved. I think maybe that's over-aggrandizing over what we've done, because I'm not sure we solved it. I think the virus has just mutated to a less virulent, uh, well, a, a form that spreads faster that causes less death, and that's probably natural selection. But so, so have, but have we learned anything from, or, or have we made ourselves more vulnerable in, in our response to the pandemic? Or, I mean, we went through maybe ten, since since the two thousand eight crash, we maybe went through ten years of weakening um, public good institutions and the social contract. Have we not seen some glimmers of light that the there's some some reversal of downward trends in in that respect in in our societies? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, I, I was feeling somewhat optimistic over the last few years that, that there do seem to be serious efforts underway to phase out fossil fuels, or, or at least greatly reduce fossil fuels. We'll, we'll never get rid of them entirely, um, but at least to phase out fossil fuels and, and to get to non-carbon sources of energy, that, that, there, that there did seem to be, I, I think, serious effort, serious direction in that regard. But then along comes a major spike in, in the price of petrol, and by golly, that's all people can talk about. In and, the short and, and term, so yeah, for sure. You know, people are asking, well, why has the price grown up? Can, to, gone up? Should we just drill more? Um, or is it that the corporations are just greedy? Um, but uh, I mean, no, no one's really, well, a few people are talking about solar energy these days, but not as an immediate solution. So, a bit so, different on this side of the pond, Joe, but over to Anne. <laughs> Well, I just, I mean, I'm not going to answer whether we're better or worse off with respect to pandemics. I, mm -hmm. I think only time will tell, and I, and I don't think there's a single answer to that. I think we might be better off for some period of time until we get distracted by something else, and then we'll defund public health institutions again as a particular example. I have hope only because people have continued to find a way, right? Even when these places were depopulated, not everyone died. They moved someplace else. I, I think we can't ask for no challenging times. I think what mm -hmm. we can ask for is whether we can reduce the amount of human suffering that happens during these challenging times. You know, people are, people can also be very innovative. So I remember being at a meeting once where, I think it was, it doesn't matter who it was, you know, they were showing all these curves. Here's fossil fuel going up, here's temperature going up, here's, here's this, that, and the other bad thing all increasing. But someone else could look at a different set of curves, and many people do, that say, you know, here's infant mortality going down, here's literacy going up, you know, here's, at least for a while, some forms of inequality shrinking. There's always good things happening with bad things. Um, I, I don't think we are, are doomed to a catastrophic collapse. I think human innovation could save us. Um, and to me, these, these transformations we're going to be going through is a culture, our goal shouldn't be to avoid them because if resilience thinking tells us anything, it's not, it's that they can't be avoided for all time, but to reduce the human suffering that will occur during them. Great. Oh, it's starting to get in a more cheerful place. I'm going to turn to Joe with a question let, from. Let, 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 let me just oh, add, add oh. something here that, and, and, and I think you're right that and when people ask me, what are we supposed to do? My most common answer is we're a species that muddles through. It's all we've ever done. It's all we ever will do. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, Joe, this is from Jonathan Dungies in the chat. Um, 
he's referring back to your book uh, and your pro proposal that one process driving collapse or at least increase driving increasing fragility of societies is the decreasing marginal returns on increasing complexity as it were to solve problems there's some the question is do you see this process at work at present e.g in efforts to address global problems such as climate change think for example of the construction of potentially costly international agreements infrastructures that's an interesting one but, well, yes, yes, of course. I mean, climate change is causing us to complexify further. Uh, the coronavirus caused us to complexify further. Uh, but, but the irony, as I pointed out, the irony is that we don't realize this because so far we still pay for it through fossil fuels. We don't know that we're increasing costs. The, the other thing I want to emphasize is that complexity is, is, is seductive. It, it grows by small increments, each of which seem reasonable at the time. What gets you is the cumulative costs of, of all the solutions, all the problems you solved in the past and the one you're trying to solve now, the cumulative costs are, are, are ultimately, I think, what would bring on diminishing returns. Mm. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna to turn to a question still in the Q&A for a minute um, for both of you. So I'll come to Anne first. This is from Michael E. Smith. In spite of great interest and lots of research and publications, the scientific understanding of collapse is very low. You two excluded, of course. <laughs> uh, why is that? By scientific, I refer to rigorous comparative quantitative analysis. All right, so kind of with a quantitative angle as well. So. Basically, uh, why are we still struggling I mean, I, with the same class? The short answer is it's hard. That's not a very satisfying answer. But I mean, let's just look at our scientific understanding of recession. Hmm. Right? This is something that impacts huge numbers of people. Economists have been doing com quantitative comparative studies for a long time, and we still can't predict when we're going into a recession. Um, so I, you know, I think it comes back to the long list of things that Joe put down as at least to when societies collapse. There are 64 different things influencing those systems in different quantities at different times. Um, and, and how you look at both the social and environmental configurations that produce endogenous stress and visit on top of that unanticipated exogenous stresses and come up with a single explanation, it, def it, it defies us. And having said that, I think we could do more, right? I think I would love to see more quantitatively oriented people get engaged. I think at the same time, we might wanna embed what I would call epistemologists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. people who say, how do we know what we know? What does it mean to even have a theory? Our definition of what a theory is differs among disciplines and subdisciplines. Um, so, so more reflective thinking on how it is we know what we know and what we think we know, uh, and then some formalization. Though I resist the notion that all theory can be quantified, can be formally quantified. Um, I think would be great. So if we if we could increase those collaborations, it would be to the benefit. Good. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that too. Um, that when I did the collapse study, I thought there were three cases that were well enough documented to warrant an, an in-depth discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've since added two more, mm -hmm. um, but, I'll, but I'll also mentioned that in regard to the Roman collapse, I, I did a quantitative analysis of the, the debasement of the Roman silver currency. It's, it did. Um, it, it's really a well-documented case study. Um, and, and what I found is that it's mathematically regular up to 269 AD. Um, that that, um, that a trinomial equation accounted for, I think it was 98% of the variance. And um, it, it, I mean, it, it's like the English wage and wage and price series data. It's 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 the only data series in prehistory that's almost as good as that English series. Um, and, and 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 what it indicated is that the Roman government was always in arrears. It was always short of money, as governments always tend to be. Uh, you know, I, I wrote once in, in a book that was published in 2003 that there was rarely if ever a solvent government in the 20th century, and there certainly aren't very many today, if any. Yeah, thanks for reminding us of that. 
Uh, yeah, I still, still have it in my mind's eye, that beautiful graph you have in your book of the Denaris sort of devaluing over time and this one emperor who sort of saw the, saw the fall and tried to re reverse the, the trend and it lasted not, yeah. not a jot before it carried off, carried on falling. So just taking chair's privilege for a second, there are so there is a, some recent efforts to try to take this idea that we can potentially, if we have the data, we can look at the resilience of a, of a society as, as, as we can look at the resilience of any complex system. And we might try to do that by looking at how um, some quality of that society fluctuates and whether fluctuations become longer lived or a response to perturbations gets slower. Um, Tim Kohler, who um, sort of obliquely mentioned on, on a slide, has been gathering, you know, with collaborators, you know, and mentioned um, data on that. And my friend Martin Sheffer has been having a go at this with the Pueblo societies. So, and have you had a look at that sort of line of attack? Do you think there might be merit in trying to chase this idea of general indicators of loss of resilience of a society over time? Yeah, but, I, I mean, I, I, I think... Well, I think both of them have done good work. And, and I think looking at the long-term patterns does bring some hope, right? Because we expect fluctuations. And if you look at Simon Levin's work, he would, he would suggest we actually want to ebb and flow between a tighter and looser structure that, that uh -huh. different challenges require different configurations, right? So, but, but if you take a long enough time perspective, you might be able to see it. I, Except that these, you know, after the fact observations, I'd like to see what, I mean, they're only going to look at historical societies. Does it lead us to have any predictive capacity or does it just allow explain after the fact explanations? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I admire the work of both of them. I think they've contributed a lot here. Joe, what do you take? What's your take? Well, on? I, I'll just add that Peter Turchin runs a website where he's trying to bring together uh, somehow a comparison of, of collapse cases. I think it's collapse cases. I can't tell you where the website is, but you can certainly find it. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't paid attention to it because I'm pretty skeptical about it. <laughs> yeah, understood. All right, let's turn to Christina um, in the in the Q&A. How could we stop the elites from bringing down the society closer to the brink of collapse for their own benefit? Are there any lessons from history? <laughs> So I, 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 I don't know of a yeah. case where that happened. Uh, I, I can't think of a case. You mean I, that they... I, I think it's just too simplistic. Okay. So you can't think of a case where the elites were sort of part of the problem and then to, chose to mend their ways, or you or you think that that portrayal of the cause of collapse is just too crude? No, no. I I, I would say it is not by itself the cause of collapse. There are yeah. always there are always yeah. other things going Good. on. And what's your... Well, I mean, I, I agree, and I ended mine with that. Uh, and I, I think it's a problem, but I think they contribute, right? I think the choices of the elites contribute. And the problem is, short of revolution, the only way to alter the elites is to, is through political change. And of course, the politicians are part of the elite, so it's it's hard to seek solutions in those quarters. I, you know, when uh, when I worked with the Resilience Alliance, we used to get communities to do resilience assessments. And one of the things we tried to get them to think about was the constraints visited on them from the top, right? It, it's, it's kind of, well, I do this through leadership at the university as well, right? I'll talk to faculty members who are facing a challenge and their answer is I want the Dean to solve the problem for me. And I'm like, okay, but let's pretend the Dean isn't going to solve the problem for you. Like, what are you gonna do, <laughs> right? So I do think part of what we can do at smaller scales is making, make sure that we're investing in ways that, that we could survive with, again, with less human suffering, some transformations. But the bottom line is short of revolution, we have little influence over what the elites are trying to do. I, I think the lens of history would suggest that even when you have those revolutions, the next group just becomes the new elite with all the same problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm going to turn to 
Diane Liverman, who had a question actually in the Miro board, I'm going to ask first. Um, Diane is saying, I sometimes wonder if work on climate and collapse is too focused on looking for collapse first and then looking for climate explanations, <laughs> indeed, rather than looking for climate changes and seeing if they had positive, negative or neutral impacts on societies. What do we know about past drought that did not result in collapse, for example? Well, lots, I think, is the answer, um, but uh, I'll be tempted to, to answer the question myself, but I'll come to, to Anne first and then to Jo. Um, so, I mean, my, uh, the group I was working with was, was you're, you're, that's fair. We were more interested in what explained, I mean, just, there was just an overall transformation in the American Southwest between 1100 and 1450 AD. And we wanted to know what explained those transformations more than earlier persistence. Um, I mean, pe people knew they were settling on an arid landscape. They had strategies for dealing with drought. Uh, so I, I, I do think it would be interesting to probe some of those earlier drought periods that did not indicate such change in the material record and, and ask potentially why. Yeah. I, my guesses are A, that population levels were just lower and so that helped quite a bit. And that was probably one of the big things. Um, most of these grew and all of these groups grew in population over time. Um, but I, I, I completely agree with you, right? It's just like archeology span in the old days that what was fascinating and sexy were the, the tombs of the elite and the ways, even Pompeii, the ways in which ordinary citizens were li living were not of interest. And then we've learned an enormous amount by turning to the ways ordinary citizens were living. And I agree that we could learn a lot more and stress test our understanding of collapse if we spent a lot more time looking at persistence. Mm -hmm. Joe, do you want to come in on this? What examples well, of yeah, drought? Again, go back, go back to the case of the Roman Empire, which drew its revenues originating from everywhere, from the upper reaches of the Nile to the north of Britain and just about every place in between. Um, you know, a, a, a bad crop in one place is easily offset by better crops elsewhere. I'm going to just take Chair's prerogative and continue the theme a little bit, because others have written persuasively, to my eyes at least, that sometimes if you go back to the origin of Nile societies or even back to Mesopotamia, um, drought might be argued to be the trigger of the rise of social complexity in the first place, because people who were spread out in a bountiful landscape uh, were hit with a bad, bad situation, maybe the wild fowl in the swamps of, of what's modern day Iraq are suddenly not there anymore, whatever. But you, know, you can make a case that a drought concentrates people around uh, maybe the Nile in the case of the browning of the Sahara uh, and, uh, and out of that somehow comes complexity, maybe out of adversity comes complexity because you, like Joe, you've always argued, you, you've suddenly got a big problem to solve. Oh my God, how am I going to manage this now scarce water resource? Um, sorry for ad living a bit, but do you think there might be any, any, um, any, any, any validity at all in that line of argument that actually, you know, Joe, maybe that climate stress could be could be an instigator of complexity. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's some good work at assembling data on on Nile floods in the past, mm -hmm. um, and and in some cases those do seem to be associated with political upheaval. Um, in, in in other cases, people are postulating, or, or actually the Egyptians themselves were postulating that oh, we've been invaded by these horrible people, the Hyksos in the Nile Delta. And, you have to wonder if that was just an excuse because it, Egyptian inscriptions were always propaganda. Um, you know, did, did that area temporarily simply rebel and break away? And, and could that have been due to, you know, failure to control floods or, or, or simply a failure of the floods? Uh, I, I don't want to suggest that environmental variation is, is, is unimportant, but it's something that societies deal with. I mean, it, it's normal, it's common. Um, you know, there, there's this, this idea that a, a massive drought caused the Maya collapse. Um, well, the first time I read that, I, I, I looked around and found examples of 
people who have cultivated maize on 10 centimeters of moisture a year. Um, so precipitation in the myelolins could decline by 90%. And with the right uh, crop to be, you know, seed stuff to begin with, they could have still cultivated. It would just, it would just have to be more intensive, more labor intensive. Great. Right. I'm now conscious of the clock, but I'm going to try and get through some of the remaining questions on the Q&A. So maybe, Anne, I'm going to come to you with Lewis's question. Can globalization or can, can globalization be also observed with these complexity lenses? So I guess the question is. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, I mean, the, the short answer is yes, but I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, but I mean, globalization is a form of complexification in, in, in terms of creating a network structure that is more complicated than you had than you had before. So I think the, the short answer is yes. I think potentially equally interesting parts of globalization. So the, the pieces of the work in the American Southwest I didn't talk about tried to do measures of rigidity and conformity in societies, measures of hierarchy, um, you know, if you look at the resilience liter literature, at least coming out of the Resilience Alliance, which influenced my thinking a lot, so I'm not um, trying to discredit it in any way, but, but there is this kind of mantra that diversity is a good thing, and I, I think in society that's not always true. I mean, the example I will give in class is that I'm kind of glad we all have a, a, a uniform response for what we're supposed to do when the fire alarm goes off. Yeah. really don't want 30 different solutions to this problem. I just want us all to move out the door. And so, uh, you know, I think globalization also in, in addition to introducing um, complexity can introduce homogeneity, which can be good or can be bad. And, and it's worth looking at that part of it as well. Great. Um... I'm going to just in the interest of time, I'm going to try and get through some of the remaining questions. So Tony, I'll try this one on Joe. Tony is asking when people and communities who face floods, moving sand dunes, rising, falling lake levels, tsunami or other environmental stresses respond by moving to safer places. Would you regard this as collapse or rapid loss of complexity? Um, uh, no, it, it, that is not necessarily part of my definition of collapse. My, my colleagues who work in, in the American Southwest, where there were persistently large-scale regional abandonments that, that Anne has described, um, used to describe those as collapses. And, and, and I pointed out that if the people who moved established communities of equal complexity wherever they went, it's not a collapse. It's, it's just a, an, an immigration. And, and, and so that, that, I mean, that would be my answer to, you know, if people move, does complexity change? And, and, that would, and that would be something you would need to ascertain. Absolutely. And then I'm gonna give you the last question from Diana. As we examine cases of collapse in societies that persist today through indigenous descendants, how do we respect indigenous knowledge and origin beliefs and build capacity among indigenous scholars to participate in this research? Well, Diane is the one who would have better answers to that than I do. I, you know, I, I, I see a lot of tensions in scientific inquiry, and we've talked earlier about quantification and formalization. Um, and that tends to be privileged as a way of knowing things. And I, and I don't know how you simultaneously weave that desire for formalization into a true embrace of pluralism that says given incomplete knowledge, there is always more than one uh, possible description or possible explanation for the phenomenon we observe. I can only say we haven't done a very good job of this as an academy. Um, and I'm not sure that many disciplines are structured to do a very good job of it. We are not structured to privilege other ways of knowing relative to the way we know we tend to hold in higher regard the way that we know something than the way that others know something. So I think it's gonna require some real education and some generational change. But perhaps that's the kind of diversity of ways of knowing that would help us uh, in, in, in searing crises. Great. But as scholars, we're not trained to think that way. Indeed. All right, well, thank you both. Um, I wanna give uh, 
well, those in the audience a chance to give you both a round of applause as well with the virtual applause or whatever. Um, so brilliant stuff from Joe and Anne there. Thank you for the excellent presentations and uh, fielding that um, fantastic set of questions. Thanks everybody who stayed online to participate in the discussion in the chat and on the Miro board. That Miro board stays alive or active for at least the rest of this week. So if you want to keep talking about what this conversation has provoked there, do so. Um, we're going to have a summer break in the seminar or webinar series, but we've got plans for autumn events on tipping points in coral reefs, in cloud feedback. So maybe we'll come back to societies as well. And also I want to I give a short plug um, to announce that we're going to have an in-person, if you can make it, um, Tipping Points meeting, in, uh, which I'm hosting with my colleagues at the University of Exeter, the 12th to the 14th of September. So I think uh, hopefully a link to the chat is there in the, Sorry, a link to a sign up page to find out more is in the chat if you uh, if you look in there. And next week, we should be opening for registrations for that. We'd love to see uh, many of you in person. Um, but yeah, my thanks again uh, at that point, at this point, to Joe and Anne for fielding a fantastic discussion there and for your great presentations. And we look forward to resuming uh, conversations on tipping points uh, after a well-earned summer break, uh, hoping for no catastrophic tipping points during the summer. We'll be back in the autumn. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you. Very enjoyable. Thanks to everyone for the questions.